Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. I'm David Weston. I'm delighted to be joined right now by the federal, the, the president of the Chicago Fed. He is Austin Goolsby. Austin, thanks for being here. You bet. So we're out here for the Aspen Economic Strategy Group meetings. A lot of talk about uh, fiscal issues, monetary issues, but we all have now the, the key job figures. A little bit lighter than expected, 187,000 instead of 200,000. A little heavier than expected on the wages. What did you take on them? It was pretty much what we expected. I mean, the, let's remember the jobs number is whatever it is, plus or minus 120,000 a month. So we, there's no point quibbling over, over numbers. The job market is cooling a little to, to kind of a balanced level, but it's still extremely strong. That's the strongest part of the economy by far is how low the unemployment rate is, and people can get a job if they, if they want a job. And to that point of being tight, 187,000 plus or minus, is still way more than you need just to catch up, with, to keep even with the new people coming into the workforce. So it is tightening in that sense, is it not? I, I think that's right. You know, let's say 100,000 uh, yeah. just from population and what's coming into the workforce. So it's stronger than that. It's been the surprise of the year, of the six months, that all of the people that that folks thought were gone from the labor force never to return a lot of them are coming back you know when it's when the job market is as strong as that you've seen labor force participation rise back to levels that we hadn't seen for for several years at least so that's been great i mean that that's the strongest part of the economy yeah none of us wants anybody to be out of a job so it's a good thing it's done this many people have jobs but what about the wages we're now these numbers were 4.4 percent year over year i believe it was uh, that doesn't sound like something consistent with getting to two percent inflation overall. I, uh, the, the way I view it is uh, two things. One, you can't say anything about wages until you actually know what's happening with productivity. We got some productivity numbers; they were they were strong for the quarter. That's very noisy. But if you have strong productivity growth, you can have wage growth, and it doesn't generate inflation. And the other thing about wages is they're not a leading indicator of price inflation. They're backward looking. They move, wages move more slowly. When things happen, we get shocks. The prices move first and then the wages. So when we see what's happening to wages today, this is kind of an amalgam of a bunch of stuff that, that already occurred. I think if you want to know if you're beating inflation, go watch the inflation. You know, mm-hmm. the, the price series and especially the new months of inflation in, in, in the core. That's really what you want to be watching. What are those numbers telling you right now, particularly goods inflation? Is it a bit stickier than you thought? It has been, but the last couple of readings have been pretty positive. Uh, it's important that you raise this goods. Loosely, if you look at core inflation, you got goods, you got housing, you got services, not including housing. And We've much remarked on the skinniness and persistence of services inflation. But we knew that. that, that that's, not, that's not where we went wrong over at the end of last year, beginning of this year, w- with inflation l- lasting a little longer than we thought. It has been that goods prices, while down, have not gone all the way down to where they were before the pandemic. I feel like that's kind of started and that's put the Fed on this line. I mean, it's a thin line to walk, but getting the prices down without having a big recession, we're going to Johnny Cash this thing <laughs> and, and walk that line. And that's for sure the goal. Uh, and goods prices got to come down. And then the next one's got to be housing. As you know, it's the, the housing that's in the CPI is based on a bunch of market rents and it takes a while to flow through. So hopefully as we go into the fall, that's, that's going to be the next one. So also let's stick with the Johnny Cash. Yeah. Walk in that line. Yeah. Okay. How long is the line? And we know that the target is 2%. Yeah, it doesn't right. feel like you're going to come off that 2% goal. But how long till you get there? How patient can you be? We, we got to be somewhat patient. You know, take as just a microcosm example this thing with housing. We've seen the market rents coming down. But it takes a while for that to flow through into the, let's call it the average 
housing prices that are in the CPI. And you just got to be patient. I know everybody wants to say, ah, fine, Bob, we're done. That's that's not how it works. If you walk the golden path and, and, and you walk that line, it's it's going to take a while. And the rather than arguing about the peak rate of how many more rate increases do there need to be, what we should probably start thinking about is that, well, how long does this last that you're going to be at, at these elevated rates? It's been a 500 plus basis point increase over a relatively short period. If you hold at five and a quarter, five and a half, five and whatever, while inflation goes down, that is a restrictive environment. Yeah. Holding is is increasing restrictiveness in, in that sense. Austin, let me ask you one other question that came up this week, which is the Fitch rating uh, on the U.S. sovereign debt that took that. It surprised a lot of people, I think. Uh, is it important? And I'm, I'm not saying was the rating important in itself, but is what they're pointing toward important? In a vague sense, yes, but everybody knows that. I mean, we went through the debt ceiling every day. We're talking about hey, this This is dysfunctional. We, we've got to get out of this dynamic. I was around in Washington the last time we went through this downgrade thing. There's a couple of things I don't understand about it. Ultimately, I don't think it's going to make that much difference. This isn't like a some obscure stock or bond that nobody knows and it's ah the rating agency went and looked at it so you don't have to i mean this is u.s treasury is <laughs> the most observed market with with the most information in the entire world so uh, i don't know what their motivation was i'm not gonna i'm not gonna guess at that but i i guess i don't see how something else is going to be rated triple a if they were defaulting on U.S. Treasuries, it seems like that would be a bad day for the market. But also, let me ask you a different question. We've heard various Fed presidents, uh, Jay Powell, but also Janet Yellen, talk about the fiscal sustainability of the path the United States is on and expressing some concern over the long term that it's not sustainable. If that's right, what are the consequences of that? And what, if anything, can be done about it? That's a whole separate topic from the, you know, what should the ratings of treasuries be for right now? But Fitch invoked that, right, in their their, their announcement. But then the proper question is, did something happen in the last two weeks that made you think that was different? Um, As you know, the Fed doesn't weigh in on fiscal policy. Congress and the administrations, they they have to sort that out. I th- my read of the evidence is exactly what you say, that the long run, there's a fiscal gap in the United States. That long run gap, smaller in the United States than in most of the advanced, if not all of the advanced economies of the world, because our demographics are better. It's rooted in the aging of the population and Social Security and Medicare and, and things like that. And the U.S. has got some choices that it has to make but gets to make in a way that some other countries don't get to make them. They already have income tax rates higher than our rates. They already have 20, 25% VATs. They have worse demographics. Their spending levels are already higher to start with. Those fiscal questions, will they will be with us for decades because the baby boomers are going to re, all retire, uh, I think, you know, over the, over the next couple of decades. That's different from what we're trying to do with the Fed. You know, our, our job is we accept the economy as it is. We go watch the data and we t- maximize employment and stabilize prices. That's what we're going to do. One other development this week uh, that a lot of people took note of is Bank of America changed their call on recession. They had been predicting a recession in the fourth quarter of this year or the first of next. And that sort of trails what we heard actually from the Fed chair last week that the Fed staff now has taken in recession as I understand off the table. We're going to walk that line. Yeah. That's what I'm telling so you. The that golden where, path. That's that where, what we got to stay on. And is that where you are? You know, you I, I, is, I don't know if it's just what I want or if that's where I am. But I, I feel like we've been getting promising numbers on inflation. The new months of inflation. In, in core inflation, especially goods and especially housing over the next several months. That's what let's keep an eye on. That will tell us, are we on this golden path or not? If, if we are able to pull this off, that will be a triumph. There are many smart people, and you've talked to them, on the air who say it's impossible. The Fed, kids, the Fed has never been able to reduce inflation as much as we're reducing it, and we need to now. 
without generating a big increase in the unemployment right. rate and a big recession. So, and while that has historically been true, this was a weird business cycle. It can be a weird recovery. And, and I am hopeful that we can pull it off. And so far, we've been doing it. You know, if you look back a year, the unemployment rate is not up and inflation has come way down. Well, in fact, it came down a little bit, I think, this month, if anything. It came yeah, down a right. tiny, right, from what was expected. But, but I, I want to be absolutely clear on this. You think that we can get inflation under control with unemployment rate in the mid threes? I don't know if it's exactly the mid threes. What my goal, and I think that we can pull off, and it's what we should try, is to stay on a path where you get inflation down and you don't have a major recession. And there are a lot of people who, if you have in your mind this stable relationship trade-off between mm -hmm. unemployment and inflation, that's that the golden path is impossible. But if you believe that, the data have just not mm -hmm. been backing that up. We've gotten inflation down a fair amount mm -hmm. without increasing the unemployment rate. And the job market does need to get into balance. We have been in spots where it's been out of balance right. so hot that it's right. that it's it's not stable right. but we're we're right. doing that over these right. past couple of months you see the quit right. rate you see the vacancy rate yeah. relative to how many unemployed there are yeah. and you see the jobs numbers pulling more yeah. into balance walk that line walk Johnny that Gatt. line <laughs> there you That's go. What it is. okay austin Goolsby, thank you so much he is the president of course of the chicago fed you're listening to the team Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app, or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get back to the jobs number. Uh, you know, we had a little bit lighter than expected in terms of the total number of jobs, but a little stronger on the wage side. Uh, so let's break it down a little bit. We'd like to do that on Jobs Day with Tom Gimbel. He's the CEO at LaSalle Network. Tom, what was your takeaway from uh, what we heard this morning from uh, the federal government on the jobs? Well, first, I've got a bone to pick that I was in the office last month or in the studio last month and you weren't there. You avoided uh, me. Yes. So, <laughs> on the just for the just for the record. <laughs> Good. You know Noted. what I'm going to say? We, we have 187,000 jobs added. I mean, are yep. we kidding ourselves that we say it's not a good jobs market? It is an, a, a really, really strong market. I think it sends the right message to both Wall Street and Main Street is that the market is still very, very healthy. And at the same time, it sends a message to the Fed that it's down a little bit from where it was. So we'll probably see a little bit of a hold at the next uh, rates meeting and, and they won't raise. Yeah, interesting. I mean, when you look through where the jobs are being created, what stood out to you? I mean, listen, it's always going to be bigger when you're doing uh, when we're in this type of market with low unemployment in the services sector and the hospitality sector. And I, I think we're looking for bad news instead of appreciating what's going on. We've got record low unemployment again. We've got uh, increase in wages of four tenths of a, of a point again right we continue to see these really positive signs throughout the report and we're trying to find the one thing that might be reason for alarm we know that eventually we're going to hit a, a bumpy cycle but we should really enjoy things while they're good so i mean what's really good in this one if you're a worker is 4.4 percent gain in wages from the prior year and that's the second straight month we, we've seen that and it was above all economists forecasts who called for a slowdown so Good for the workers out there. What's driving that, do you think? I think it's inflation. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I think this is this is the problem that we have is that Main Street doesn't understand that when wages go up for everybody across the board, that the cost of goods are going to go up um, equally, if not exponentially, to, to cover that. And so, the the you know, I, I'm not sure if everybody's realized that making more money and having things cost <laughs> more money is sometimes a, a neutral a neutral. Uh, situation and so there's there's some lack of education that exists with with the common person and i'm including myself in that with all with all of us that we need to understand how the markets work and what we're seeing though is that companies are still hiring they're not hiring in mass that's the biggest challenge that we're seeing is that in 2021 and 2022 it was such a rebound from COVID that companies were hiring hundreds if not thousands of people in order to take advantage of this recovery from 
the the three month recession that existed in 2020 because of the pandemic. Now we're in a very similar situation to 2018 and 2019, which is a really good, strong economy. But the difference is then we were scrambling for people. Now we're not. We've seen people re-enter the workforce. We've seen a lot of the gig workers transition back and, and businesses really seems to be healthy. What do you make of the fact that every single payroll release in the first half of the year has been revised lower? Uh, apparently, this is the longest streak of down, downward revisions since the global financial crisis. What do you think of that? I think that it shows that predictions and economists are, are not always right. I think it shows that we have to be careful of of relying too heavily on on what we process of information versus the the eye test and the smell test of what we see on the street and that there's the the revisions are 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 real and legitimate but at the same time it's not like we're seeing uh negative jobs reports every month we're still seeing growth so you know i think again we're looking for for negativity and as i say every month you know let's stop being chicken little and let's let's enjoy the rain and not think the whole sky is falling Yep. All right, Tom, uh, good jobs number. Um, no question about it. Continues to be, re- this job market is just so resilient. It's just amazing. Tom Gimbel, CEO at LaSalle Network. We like talking to Tom every uh, month when we get those uh, jobs numbers. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We also like talking to Anurag Rana when we've got two big tech companies reporting earnings. Anurag Rana, senior tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, joins us here. So Anurag, you know, we've got Amazon, we've got Apple. Let's start with Apple. Um, The services was the story here. Is that where I should focus or should I focus on the fact that, you know, they're not selling the, the growth rate for, you know, iPhones and all that kind of stuff, not what it was. Where should we put the focus? Well, the focus really is for iPhone, as we said, even in the preview, it's going to be a boring quarter because the next one is going to be launched in September, which you know should start selling, let's say, sometime in October or November. And that's really what the next push for the, the cycle is going to come from. Services growth is actually a good thing because it's a much more higher margin business and a much more recurring business that we always understand. And it's also once you you know get on iCloud, you're not going to get back and you know try to get your data somewhere else. So that's really uh, encouraging that it's still growing in constant currency in uh, in double digits. Margins are over seventy percent in terms of gross margins. So I like it both. Um, the product has to uh, to come back. The product growth has to come back. And I think that's just a function of time. It's it's not a question that it's never going to be back. It's just a matter of a quarter or two that we should see a bounce back in in iPhones. I feel like we have this consternation every time uh, Apple reports that, hey, they haven't introduced a a massive amount of new uh, exceptional products. They haven't recreated the iPhone um, enthusiasm. I mean, should we just generally get away from that? Should we expect them to become much more of a services oriented business? I hate to say that because, you know, of of what the iPhone is. Yeah, as a, as a financial analyst, that's a very the right way to do it. But you know, if I really want to get and talk about you know newsy things, then uh, you know it's always fun to talk about new products. But I had I don't think any new product is going to be anywhere close to what the iPhone is to Apple. And uh, largely the reason for that is the size of uh, the install base, the reach of what it does. Even if you think about a car, I mean, how many units can they sell? Mixed reality headsets, how many can they sell? I mean, that's iPhone right. they sell over. 200 million units a year of iPhones. Irrespective of the economy, they sell a lot of iPhones. And that really should and is the most important part of Apple. All right, let's switch gears to our our friends in Seattle. Amazon, uh, really strong quarter. The street really likes what they heard last night. What was your takeaway? Yeah, I've been smiling since yesterday evening because <laughs> this is really, I think, by, <laughs> puts a bottom to the cloud story that, you know, we have been uh, trying to defend for almost a year now that, you know, please do not worry. It will come back. It will come back. And I think they said that maybe the next quarter you will see um, similar growth rates to th- this year, which is uh, this quarter, which is somewhere around 12 percent. And then, you know, we are really expecting an acceleration going into next year. We just put a note out. We think 
next year AWS growth is is going to be north of 20%. Um, you know, market consensus still is about 14, 15%. We think we, we should see a, as a good rebound, not just in growth rate, but margins also. Now, I'm not sure exactly how many times Amazon mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, what do you make of, of how uh, their mentions of AI and generative AI and where that plays out in their business? I mean, are you positive on that or do you think they're hitting the right tone? Yeah, I think I was in the minority because I was not the I was probably the only not the only one who was saying that oh no AWS is so behind and like I don't believe any of that stuff because at the end of the day AWS controls the biggest portion of cloud infrastructure which is the nuts and bolts of what people need to put the this this particular piece together. They may not have a, a you know relationship with OpenAI, but that is not everything. If a company needs to develop a generative AI product in house where they're going to take their own data not worry about exposing it to any other outside l large language model or any AI model. They're going to build it using uh, cloud infrastructure tools, AWS being the leader among them. Now, it's going to take some time for this thing to really impact growth rate, probably two to three years, but I really think Amazon is one of the biggest beneficiaries of this trend. All right, Anurag, great stuff as always. Really appreciate getting a few minutes of your time. Anurag Rana, he's a senior tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, two big heavyweights last night, Amazon and Apple. A little bit of a tale of uh, two tapes there. Apple trading off about 3% here uh, and Amazon up 10%. Uh, big, big move for Amazon. So uh, get the skinny on what's happening in the world of big tech with Anurag Rana. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app, or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist for LPL Financial. Uh, Quincy, thanks so much for joining us again. Again, we had a, a jobs print today. We've got some a lot of inflation data points we've seen over the past several weeks. You put it all together, what do you expect our Federal Reserve to do in the coming months? Well, you know, I, I, I always like to say that the Fed is data dependent, but I think the market is more ferociously data dependent than even the Fed. And, you know, next week we do get the CPI report. They, they've got over, over 45 days before they have to make a decision. But the fact is, I don't think that they are going to back down if they feel that inflation remains sticky and is not untangling fast enough. I think the market makes a mistake that the Fed will somehow say, well, let's just pause and wait and see. They're not going to wait and see that much. And besides which, you know, they don't want to get involved in the election season. That's something the Fed has always tried to keep away from. And uh, but more than that, you know, they're focused on, on making sure that inflation moves in the right direction and doesn't have a chance to, uh, to create another bout of inflation. And you mentioned gasoline prices. Granted, it's headline, but let's just face it. Consumers are very much affected by gasoline prices in terms of how they see future inflation. And that's something the Fed does not want to see. Yeah, but isn't that sort of... A I guess the whole idea that the Fed can push against Saudi Arabia making decisions to extend its, you know, production cuts, um, isn't it just kind of a fallacy that the Fed has the true ability to control exactly what's happening with oil prices? And shouldn't companies have been factoring this in, just understanding that most of the commentary from energy analysts was that oil is probably going to be tight by the end of the year? Well, yeah, no, the Fed, the Fed can't. I mean, the Fed, look, the, the, the administration couldn't. Uh, President sure. Biden went to uh, Saudi Arabia to try to come back with a good deal and, and you know, just the opposite. So th they have their own vested interest. We know what it is. It is to get oil prices up as much as possible. Their budget is huge. They're building cities. They're trying to create a, a landscape post crude oil. And that requires higher um, oil prices. So they, you know, the market had expected that before today's panel uh, discussion that they're having online, that the Saudis would come in and say, hey, we're going to extend those quote unquote voluntary cuts through September, which they did. But what's interesting about this is that it didn't work. I mean, the, 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 when the market was fixated, obsessed by recession, 
it actually uh, made no difference about the about the production cuts. Absolutely no difference. So now all of a sudden, when you have a, sort of a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the uh, GDP growth in the country, suddenly uh, the question is, what about those prices? What what you know? What's going to happen? Uh, look, without some exogenous shock, it's hard to see that they're going to get oil prices up to 90 bucks a barrel on WTI. But you see, it's already moving up above 80, a little, little bit, little bit. Uh, companies do well. Uh, American oil companies do well, $45 a barrel. Um, but the fact remains, for the average American, we know this statistically. They may not even drive. They may drive. Uh, electric vehicles but when they see those prices inching higher the the one year and especially the three year projections for inflation move higher and here's the other statistic that goes right along with it then they blame the uh, administration right. regardless of power regardless split. of yep. a party all right quincy we've had about 80 percent of the s p 500 companies report here um, do you feel like we're at an earnings trough here, or how do you think about earnings going forward based upon what you've seen so far in this second quarter? Well, you know, it's, it's been a discerning market. It, isn't a mar it has not been a market that has, you know, given a pass to companies that are missing, even missing slightly. Uh, they've been punished. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there's resiliency in, in, in the companies, obviously, X energy but uh, the fact of the matter is, we we also see that 2024 will see a you know a nice uh, a climb higher with with companies. The thing to look for though, uh, to push those prices higher, the share prices higher, is that we also expect to see a pullback in the amount of share buybacks, and you know that has been a tremendous catalyst for the uh, stock market. Quincy, talk us through a little bit more on the the jobs report um, today. You know, was there was there a surprising detail for you uh, to come out of this in terms of where we're headed? Well, it was interesting to see the unemployment rate come down, right? And uh, then to see the uh, wage growth remain, quote unquote, sticky. The Fed doesn't want to see that. And, and why that's so important is there is a political tug of war about it. Uh, you can see it uh, in the, the part that political parties, but you also see it on Wall Street. Why does that bother the Fed? Why does that bother Chairman Powell specifically? Why can't he be happy about the higher wages? Because they're going to low wage earners. And the fact is the concern from a completely apolitical perspective is companies want to pass along those costs. Once the wages are higher, it is an input cost, and it is one of the most important input costs for uh, companies. So it hasn't leveled off. Everyone was expecting three-tenths of a percent. It stayed at four-tenths of a percent. That is what was so surprising. The expectations and the hopes were, let that come down, and boy, will we celebrate. Because that I think the market felt, that'll clinch it. The Fed is finished. All right, Quincy, given that backdrop as it relates to interest rates, that backdrop as it relates to some of the economic conditions out there, and we had um, Mr. Goolsby from the Fed talk to David Weston today from Bloomberg saying that they're trying to walk that fine line of keeping inflation in check uh, while not pushing his economy into a recession. Given all that background, I got a market that's doing great this year. The S&P 500 is up about 18 percent. The Nasdaq's up about 34 yeah. percent. How much more do we have to go here? Am I, am I, should I be jumping in here? What's your call? Well, you know, in terms of seasonality, unless there's a surprise and, and this turns out to be a good, good season as opposed to choppy and dicey, uh, the, how many catalysts are there right now? Maybe, maybe next week the CPI report could be a tremendous catalyst to, to push this market up despite the negative seasonality. So if we start to see that core come down, I think it could be, a, uh, a again, a catalyst to keep the market moving higher. But earnings are an important catalyst. And obviously, we're going to get the um, a retail picture about the U.S. consumer with the consumer, consumer names. But remember, it has been led by the uh, big tech. That's what started all of this, the big tech, mega tech led. So maybe you have to wait until August 23rd for NVIDIA to come out. That was the one... That was the one performance. It, it was a triple play, right? Uh, revenue growth, 
bottom line, the guidance was stupendous. And what it did was it confirmed that high move in uh, the, the megatech, anything associated with artificial intelligence. They're coming out on August 23rd. The market may have to wait for that. But overall, if we can see that core, super core inflation coming down at a quicker pace that untangles the stickiness, yep. that'll be a tremendous catalyst for the market, regardless of seasonality. All right. Appreciate that. Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist, LPL Financial. Always appreciate getting Quincy's perspective here. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Looking at the risk on a take in the market today, I'm going to describe some of the move today, some of it, potentially to the comments from Austin Goolsbee president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He was interviewed by Bloomberg's David Weston earlier out in Aspen, Colorado, which is a scam in and of itself. I'll get to it <laughs> later. Um, but he said he feels that the Federal Reserve is making some headway, may having some success on walking that fine line between fighting inflation but without pushing the economy into a recession. So maybe that's helping things out. But let's check in with somebody who does this stuff for a living. Jonathan Hurdle, he's executive chairman. Hurdle Callahan and Company founded that company back in 88, was at Goldman Sachs before there, uh, was an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1975 to 1982. So we certainly thank him for his service there. But for me, the highlight is the MBA from Penn State. Um, good stuff there. Hey, John, you're out in Wyoming. Why? I don't know. But you're out <laughs> in Wyoming. Yeah, you're wearing a garb like you'd wear on Wall Street. Dude, you got this nice shirt, this tie. Is that a little formal for Wyoming? It is a little formal for Wyoming, but we're managing $20 billion. We need to pay attention wherever we are. That's what I like to hear. Very good. So, Jonathan. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, sir. How do you feel about this market? Because we're looking at the S&P up 17 18%. We've got the uh, NASDAQ up uh, 34 35%. And, yeah, boy, if, that's been a heck of a run off of a terrible 2022. What are you telling your clients these days? Well, it's pretty much a steady-as-she-goes kind of a market here. Uh, we have negotiated is that Austin Goolsby has said, you know, we're sort of on a golden path. You just yep. mentioned his name. So we've been able to avoid a recession. Uh, inflation is coming down. Wage growth is increasing, but not so much to be a problem. So it is, uh, you know, amazingly uh, positive, all the things that are coming together here. And, you know, the United States uh, is doing better than the rest of the world. This free enterprise thing seems to be working. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've got terrific managers in this country. See, the, we just heard on the Newsberg, on the Bloomberg uh, Business Flash that 80% of reported earnings have surprised, either met or surprised on a positive side. So good things are happening. Uh, the excesses that we worried about don't seem to be coming through. So it's, it's just uh, everything's working right now. Well, we're seeing, you know, continually added jobs every time we get a jobs report number. We're seeing that those bright spots uh, for corp corporate earnings. Are things too good? I mean, is this going to push the Federal Reserve to continue to raise interest rates maybe more um, than we had and than the market even is anticipating? Well, good morning, Simone. Um, my sense is, you know, you see the tenure coming down 10 basis points today and that the jobs report has taken a touch of pressure off the Fed's need to raise rates. But even if they do raise rates, I think it doesn't matter at this point. We've got a picture in place. What we need to worry about, I mean, what, what we're worrying about is the things we always worry about, like exogenous risks. Um, but the actual fundamentals of the market are sound and positive. Um, you know, the, the, we do have a high price earnings multiple on the, on the market relative to averages. But my sense is this is uh, another another signal from the market that we think we're going to have long term interest rates coming down. So, you know, the 10 year Treasury, uh, we still have an inverted yield curve, but the real return on the 10 year Treasury is not particularly high. And so that tells us that over the long run. And it also another thing is this inverted yield curve. One of the things that tells us is that the long term rates um, we still think are low, but short term, we have policy things going on that might raise rates. So this notion that we've got, we're sort of in this sweet spot continues. So 
you know, it is true that it's like we're all neurotic. So if things are good, we were there too good. And if things are bad, we hate that. So, but we're in, a, we're in sort of a sweet spot here where everything seems to be working. We're walking that line and we have to give credit to corporate managers because our way of thinking is that, you know, it's always about buying future cash flows and that comes from earnings. Uh, another thing that's really a positive impact over the last, relative to the last 10 years is, you know, for the first 30 years of my career, we had real bond yields to work with. Yep. You bonds were an important part of the portfolio. For the last 10 years, that has generally not been true. But right, right now, we're starting to get real yields again in the bonds, uh, in bonds and even money market funds. So that's a terrific tool to have back in our toolbox. So, John, you know, if I sit in a two-year treasury, I can get 4.81%. That seems pretty good. But I feel like it, it might good. be the time to maybe go out on the curve a little bit, maybe get some more duration. How, should I do that or should I just sit comfortably with my two-year? Little of each. In other okay. words, uh, you know, one of the things I, we really believe is you can't predict, you can only prepare. So when you have a two-year treasury you know, yielding almost 5%, why not? And on the other hand, if you are if you have a full duration, we're a little bit under duration on our bond portfolios today, but we've been adding duration as interest rates go higher. If you do have a pullback, this is what it means. We can't predict this. No one can predict it. But if you did have a pullback, then having that and interest rates fell, then those having longer duration would give you some protection against the pullback in the mar in the stock market. And, you know, meanwhile, you're picking up that coupon. So it's a little bit of each, you know, find the most compelling things you can do find and then believe each one a little bit. Yeah. What's the top asset class in which you're adding your marginal dollar at this point? Well, we're overweight U.S. and we're overweight um, things like healthcare uh, equipment and the you know technology stocks as a consumer facing technology stocks um, and software. So you know we're really continuing to focus on these companies that have uh, strong market share, strong balance sheets, and moats around them to keep them protect them from protect, uh, from competition. So. That's still, we, you know, our portfolio is overweight U.S. and overweight that sector. Marginal dollar comes in. We're still doing that. John, we also are looking for, that's the core portfolio. And then on top of that, of course, we're always looking for opportunistic things, for example, like private credit, which is a whole other discussion. And it really matters what segment you're in and which managers you're using and so forth. John, it looks like a beautiful day out there in Wyoming. How are our friends out there in Wyoming having a good summer? Everything's good. It's, uh, you know, I, I, my friends in the East are worried about hot and humid and it's not hot and humid here. And, you know, we've got the Jackson Hole uh, Fed meeting That's coming right. up. But I'm a, I think it's going to be a relatively a, a sort of a non-event compared to recent years, which where it's been so dramatically important. Right. Hey, John, thanks for taking a few minutes. We always appreciate getting uh, your thoughts and your perspective. Jonathan Hurdle, he's the executive chairman of Hurdle Callahan and Company coming to us uh, from beautiful. Uh, Wyoming out there. So good for them. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Again, payroll day, jobs day today. I think it was a solid number all around. Uh, the thing that jumped out at me was, you know, average hourly earnings, uh, Pretty darn healthy, up 4.4%, kind of consistent with last month. Uh, I'll take that. Uh, I wonder if our next guest uh, is with me here. Jeffrey Cleveland, Director and Chief Economist at Payton and Regal. Jeffrey, I'd love to get your, your takeaway from what we saw on the labor front and maybe, maybe more importantly, how our Federal Reserve is going to view this number. Well, I think this is a very soft landing-like, soft landing-ish. I don't know if we can use that term type report. Yep. You had solid payroll growth. Uh, of course, payrolls have been slowing over the last year. Everyone knows that. But the three-month average is still 218, which at any other era we would say is stellar job growth. So that's that's very good. The the one drag or one sector that's uh, that's been problematic is also one that everyone knows, information, uh, so the technology-type sector. So that's well-known. Everything else, we're seeing uh, pretty broad-based gains in, in, in employment. Uh, the unemployment rate is still low. I think we're just above the cycle low at, at three and a half percent. 
So I, this is the part I find most amusing, where the Fed has been hiking. It's, it's a, an historic hiking cycle, the most rapid hiking cycle since in 40 years. And the unemployment rate is below where it was when the hiking cycle began. So, you know, I like I like uh, you point out that uh, job leavers as a percentage of total unemployed in July's employment report rose to 14.6 percent. You sent us some notes across earlier. That's like a cycle high. Um, you know that I mean, that, that is even a stronger data point for this report than the overall headline number, which I guess missed analyst estimates generally. Why is this, I guess, just not a bullish let's go get them kind of sign. Uh, it seemed, you know, if it, if we're seeing this soft landing picture, then it suggests that at least the Fed's going to kind of stay back on the sidelines. Well, I think th that's the importance of the soft landing, um, you know, story. It's it's not just sem semantics. It is a indication if, if the soft landing is playing out, then, then maybe the Fed doesn't have a lot more to do. And I think you, you see that today. The equity market loves that. The bond market will love that as well. I talk to bond traders every day. They, they would <laughs> they would love it if the Fed is done. So uh, if if we are on the soft landing, then yeah, then arguably the, the, the Fed is done. Yeah, but I guess I think, that, yeah, sorry, go on. No, I mean, you, you, you bring up the uh, kind of an important issue is that maybe this job market is even stronger than this report suggests. When you dig into the internals of the report, um, still some some great signs um, that, that could be that we'll have continued growth. The unemployment rate will go even further. Uh, wage growth will remain four to five percent. And I think in that environment, the Fed might not be as pleased as the markets are today with the report. Um, uh, that could be a, a situation where you have a no landing type scenario where the economy is, is still above trend, low unemployment, solid wage growth and inflation is, is too high. It's above two percent. The Fed probably has more to do in that case, in that environment. So I think that's still a real uh, risk, that that scenario. Uh, but right now, everyone seems to be uh, glomming on to the, the soft landing. So are we taking recession off the table? Uh, yeah, we took it off the table a while ago. We, you know, we thought after SVB that there was the risk that credit was going to contract more significantly. That hasn't played out. Um, I was just looking at uh, the lending data, in the, the weekly Fed data, I mean, lending growth has slowed, but it is still up 5% roughly year over year. So we have not seen a collapse in credit. Borrowing a discount window has uh, completely um, evaporated or gone down. So the stress in the banking system is gone. So the hard landing recession is imminent type uh, stories that were out there. I think those are those are gone for the time being. So you, you have to push out your um, timing for a recession. We have the U.S. economy growing more than 2% this year in our forecast now, quarter to, on a Q4 to Q4 basis. So I know that's a little bit more bullish than the Bloomberg uh, terminal suggests, the consensus, but uh, that's where we see things here. And today's jobs report, I think, uh, doesn't change that view at all. Wow, that's so interesting. 2% growth year on year. I mean, if the two options here are no landing or soft landing, what's the kind of timeline that we see them play out? Well, I, when I think about this, I'm always talking about the next six months, the next six to 12 months. So that, that will carry us into middle of next year. I, I, I realize for some investors, some viewers, you, you don't want that. You want to know the next three to five years, but nobody can provide that. So just trying to be real, be realistic. Um, it's, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday. It's, it's quite interesting. If you, if you have for the next six months or so the no landing scenario, um, then it's possible the Fed has to do more. They, they hike even more. And then there are some ramifications for that uh, down the road that, that could mean a more significant slowdown in growth, uh, maybe some other financial market casualties. So when you think about these scenarios, um, you know, they can evolve over time. But I, I think for the next six, six to 12 months, we don't have a recession. Uh, the Fed is, at, you know, on hold or maybe hiking another another time where I don't think we're going to see things evolve is, is a recession and rate cuts. And I think that's really important uh, to take in because that has big financial market implications. We kind of were seeing that play out earlier this week with the flattening of the Treasury uh, yield curve. The way I think about it, if, it, if the Fed is on hold just where they are, um, then the longer end of the Treasury curve can drift up um, just, just for that reason. You know, the earlier this year, there's the expectation that the Fed would be cutting. And I think that underlied, um, you know, a lot of the inversion in the curve. But if that's coming out, then a flatter curve makes sense. 
Yeah, we so, kind of heard something along those lines this morning. Uh, Austin Goolsby, uh, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, was uh, interviewed by Bloomberg's David Weston, and he kind of said the same thing. He, I guess the implication was they feel like they're making some good headway walking that fine line with holding inflation down um, while not pushing the economy into recession, suggesting that that is consistent with kind of keeping rates where they are for a while. Is Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, I think this is, again, great news for the Fed. The core inflation has come down. So on core CPI, we were 6.6 at the peak year on year. Now we're 4.8. But the unemployment rate is at 3.5, as we saw this morning, below where it was when the Fed started hiking. That's all the best case scenario for the for policymakers, improvement on inflation without having a downturn. But that said, doesn't mean that the Fed is going to be cutting rates anytime soon, um, not with the unemployment rate at 3.5. And then even though we've seen an improvement in inflation, inflation is still above, well above the Fed's target. So stasis holding here might might be how things play out. But I think that has implications for two-year Treasury yields, but also 10-year Treasury yields. Uh, we're looking at some important data on CPI, on PPI, producer price index, and uh, next week, um, talk me through your expectations there. What kind of number are you looking to see? Well, the big thing for me is last month, so June core CPI was uh, softer, uh, softer than expected, and I, I think very soft. So looking for that to pick back up uh, month to month, uh, maybe a 0.3% month to month uh, mm. percent change. So uh, it could it could pour some... Uh, cold water on the on the soft landing scenario if that does play out. Um, but again, it, it ties back to our suspicion that the, the Fed is probably not done. Um, and I think that would be the conclusion if, if you do see a, uh, a pick back up in uh, the core CPI reading. So that, that's really the critical report for me. All right, Jeff, appreciate it. As always, getting your thoughts. Jeffrey Cleveland, he's a director and chief economist. Uh, at Payton and Regal. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We got movement higher yet again in energy. WTI crude oil up 1.2%. I've been calling this out for the last several weeks. Uh, this... WDI Crude's had a nice little run here. I don't know what the heck's going on. So let me bring in a couple of people that we pay to know what's going on here. Mike McGlone, senior macro strategist with Bloomberg Intelligence. He's located in the self-proclaimed crypto capital of the world, Miami Beach. Good luck with that. Uh, and Fernando Valle, senior analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. His whole career is kind of doing this energy thing. So let's start off with Mike. Mike, just from a technical perspective, why are, this thing was $67 a barrel, WTI Crude Oil, like a month, five weeks ago. Here we are at 82. What's going on? Uh, we're, hey, Paul, we're seeing a decent bounce in a market that we got very oversold. Managed money, net positions were very short. The market bounced from its 60-month moving average. But the key thing to remember about crude oil, juxtaposed to the stock market, which has that mantra, if it goes up, it will go up. <laughs> and crude oil is the opposite, opposite. Remember, and, and the point you see, the price you see on the screen was first traded in about 2007. It's when it goes up, it usually makes it go back down. And right now it's going, it's rallying on the back of not only that positions coming back, but the stock market's going up and yields are popping. But I view this as a bear market rally. And I have good bias from that. The high was put in 2008. We had that bounce up to last year that was lower than that high around 130 recently. And now we have a situation with OPEC cutting supply and Russians saying they're cutting supply. But that's typically what happens in bear markets from a cartel. They see this um, yield curve. They see the global bent towards recession. They see the declining economic growth out of China. They see the U.S. rapidly raising interest rates, and they see the risks of crude oil going lower. And this, what it normally does is it mean reverts. The question is, where is it peak and where does it go? So I look at these levels. 83 has kind of been the high since, uh, looks like, about November um, of last year. So I see we're near the upper end of the range now. All right. Fernando uh, joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Paying three dollars and eighty-three cents a gallon uh, to fill up the Beamer at the Jersey Shore—that's much higher than I want to pay. Why can't? And people are telling me there's a refinery issue, which I'm not buying, by the way. But 
that's an, ex- that's an excuse. Talk to me about the refining situation in this country. Do we have a refinery down or out or what's going on? Are you on? not buying a refinery or just no, not buying a gas? No, I want to buy a re- I'll tell you what I want to do. <laughs> I want to go down to like Corpus Christi or Gulfport or wherever they put those things and build a refinery. Can I do that? You can just revamp some of the recently shuttered refineries, including okay. in Louisiana and in Philadelphia. Uh, well, that one's going to take a lot of work. But yeah, we do have some refinery shortages. And when you look, it's not just crude prices that are driving gasoline prices higher. Crack spreads are $40 a barrel for both gasoline and diesel. So, so that crack spread is the, the difference between what I pay for a barrel of oil and what I yes, s- it, sell the, the stuff for? The diesel and the gasoline okay. that you produce it, out of it. So I want to, if I'm a producer, I want a bigger crack spread. Exactly. Nice. And they were getting, me. it's over three times what they usually get. Uh, so they're pretty healthy, and that, that just goes to show you that we are really short on the refining capacity. And I, I'll, I'll make matters worse. It actually looks worse in Europe, especially on the diesel side, because they don't have Russian crude. They've lost a lot of refinery capacity over the past uh, five years, and electricity prices there are significantly higher. So we're going to need a lot more diesel, and uh, it's not going to get cheaper anytime soon. Yeah, but I, we also see, you know, U.S. producers boosting production. The shale producers that stayed on the sidelines preserved um, their, you know, fiscal picture as even the Biden administration was telling them to get back out there to get pumping. I mean, does that kind of offset? Uh, sure, we have this maybe bottleneck in refining, but then does that sort of offset what we're hearing from Saudi Arabia around continuing those cuts? Um, does that kind of lim- put an upside ceiling to where we go with oil prices? Well, the limit is really on the demand side, as Mike was alluding to. Um, the sh- shale producers can only grow so much. Uh, there are a variety of limitations. Uh, I think the biggest and most important is the geological limitation. Uh, you just can't grow as fast as you, as, as you hoped because the productivity isn't there. Uh, and then outside of the Permian, uh, you just don't have any investments. Even when you look at the rig count, it's still relatively low. Um, frack spreads, they're not back to their peaks uh, before 2020. Um, and so we're not going to see that sort of growth. And ultimately, when it comes to gasoline and diesel prices, you have a, an added a- issue, which is what we produce in the U.S. is not really set up for what we refine in the U.S. And we need a lot more heavy crude. And when OPEC cuts barrels, they cut the stuff that we need, which is the medium and the heavier grades. And that makes especially diesel more expensive. That us all works. Mike McGlowan, talk to us about kind of just the the trading here of WTI crude or just the you know the the other energy uh, components here. How much of it is really technical versus the fundamentals that Fernando's talking about? Price is the number one factor in crude oil, and what drives price futures traders. I just love pointing that out <laughs> um, because I actually am an ex futures trader, and I've spent a good portion of my career running money and dealing with clients doing that. Um, and that's the bottom line is it's really price that drives it. Now, why do you see OPEC worried about cutting? Because they see what's happening. They see prices going down. But the bottom line is it's, we're still well above the average cost of production, the world's largest producer, producer net export of the U.S. And <clears throat> one thing I do point out and like to point out is how things have changed. Now, this is a, a, just a little bit of where uh, Fernando and I disagree is rig accounts declining is actually a very bull, a bearish sign for crude oil because if you look at what's there's been a very high correlation with rig coins counts for the last almost 20 years partly because when you drill <clears throat> down one drill you can go horizontal who knows how many ways but it's just a fact of what I show in prices and I love pointing this out a year ago is the fantasies of crude oil where people still focus on those kind of things and then people talk about lack of investment. I don't, you know, I'll be going out to the farmland again in uh, next week, and you know, in this country, we get almost 15% of our total unleaded gas now from ethanol, and that demand for unleaded gas in this country is actually declining. It's down 5% than when it was before COVID. So, and what this major bent towards EV. So I look at it as. This is an enduring bear market that's just catching up. If you want to look for a good bull market in commodities, look for gold. The price today, this year, is the average highest. The average price for gold this year is the highest ever at nineteen hundred and thirty-six dollars uh, an ounce. Um, crude oil is just the average price here is seventy-five. That's meh. That's just a normal price. It's just fluctuating around that average. So I'm going to quote, or just I think I can summarize Mike Glone's commodities call: buy gold, short everything else. Exactly. That's the trend. I mean, and he makes a living on this. It's unbelievable. He gets paid to do this stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, his commentary here is pretty, that he writes for Bloomberg Intelligence, is pretty um, 
harsh. Uh, either we are reversing our trajectory since 2009 and an upward trend, or we're in the early stages of a severe economic contraction. And he, by the way, believes the latter. I mean, Fernando, what is, what's your take? <laughs> do, do you disagree? I mean, I, I know you're, you specialize in the energy space. but <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, I agree with the, that the demand side of the equation is the biggest driver in the short term. And and Mike and I, are, his view on the short term is very aligned. We think uh, that's probably a lower price than what we're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, but then on the long term, where I'll disagree with Mike is because my homeland is poor and doesn't have a lot of energy. And that homeland for people is Brazil. And uh, we're not buying EVs. We went through blackouts <laughs> throughout my childhood. And uh, OECD, the developed countries, are now less than half of uh, energy demand globally, and the only area that grows is emerging markets. So they are the right. biggest drivers, and when you look at China having to uh, buy more coal because they don't have enough en energy, India uh, and Pakistan and their challenges with electricity, uh, believing that the whole world is going to be driving a Tesla in 10 years <laughs> is just completely nonsense to me. All right. So are your companies, your global energy companies, are they investing enough in the fossil fuel uh, infrastructure? I mean, Exxon and Chevron plan to grow 2 to 3% a year, and while BP and Shell are thinking they're going to decline. So no, in the long no. term, we're not. And then there's a question on whether Saudi can actually grow much more than they do. They always talk about a big game about growing production, and then for the past 15 years, they've been pretty much flat. So there's a lot of questions there. We don't think we have enough energy long term, and uh, solar and wind uh, won't cut it. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. All right, there you go, folks. I think that's uh, some of the smartest conversation you're going to get on energy. you got to come from a commodities perspective as well as a fundamental analyst who talks to these companies every day. That's Mike McGlone and Fernando Valle. They're both from Bloomberg Intelligence. I wonder who hired them. Um, anyway, there's a good view on the energy space there. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's talk diversity uh, and inclusion. This is Jobs Day. Let's put it in the context of diversity and inclusion. That remains obviously a challenge, uh, seemingly an ongoing challenge for most of corporate America. And that certainly includes the financial services industry, the big investment banks, to help us uh, kind of get a sense of where we are right now. Sandra uh, Quince joins us. She's the CEO for Paradigm for Parity. Uh, she joins us via Zoom. Sandra, talk to us about Paradigm for Parity. Just start us off. What is it? What are you guys trying to accomplish? Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. So Paradigm for Parity is quite simply a coalition organization that's focused on closing the gender parity gap and elevating women at every level of leadership in corporate America. We do this with a lens on racial equity. We provide our companies with a clear strategy and and then we provide them with the key tactics, the programs, um, and um, the resources that they need in order to close the parity gap. One of the interesting lines from this earnings report, Sandra, is um, that the participation rate for ages 25 to 54 uh, actually fell for the first time since late last year, mainly because women uh, were leaving the workforce. I thought, you know, there's been this run up in family formation. But, you know, do you where do you see this coming from? I know you don't necessarily have all the, the nitty gritty of the data, but what, what are the trends that you're seeing with the companies you work with? Yeah, so certainly there are women that are making decisions to leave the workforce. The companies that we're working with are really focused on how do we keep women in the workforce or become a company that women can really see themselves thriving. And some of the things that companies are doing, quite frankly, is, is they are looking for opportunities to ensure that they're hiring women, but more importantly, that they're providing developmental opportunities to support women up and through the C-suite. So whether it's sponsorship programs or whether it's programs like our Paradigm for Parity Profit and Loss Leadership Accelerator program, whereby you're exposing women to other opportunities within corporate America is critically important. And then last but not least, I think it's important that leaders create the right type of inclusive people leaders. 
um, so that, you know, whoever you're working for, that they understand some of the challenges and the issues and can really provide a workplace where all of their talent can thrive. And then companies that we're talking with are also looking at their benefits to ensure that they're meeting the needs of not only women, but their broader workforce. Uh, Sandra, what are the companies that you deal with? What are they saying or what are they asking you in light of the uh, Supreme Court decision on affirmative action? Yeah, so a part of you know what they're saying is, number one, they want to stay the course. Um, and ensure that they don't, um, you know, reverse any of the progress that they've made over time. Some of the conversations that we're having is really stems around, uh, you know, what do we do about our language? How do we ensure that we can continue to be a diverse and inclusive workforce, but ensure that we're bringing everyone along in this journey? Um, so I think many of our companies are just taking a step back and looking at um, their language to be sure that that language is inclusive. They're also taking a look at their programs to be sure that while they have opportunities around women and those that are ethnically underrepresented, that they're creating the right processes in place to ensure that they are um, inclusive in that approach, that they are promoting all people within their organizations. So for many of our organizations, it's really around staying the course but just taking a review of our processes um, and the language that we're using. Well, I mean, staying the course, though, has kind of amounted, at least in recent months, to just not talking about uh, diversity policies. I mean, that was certainly the case when you look through earnings reports um, around Pride Month after some dust-ups over particularly um, uh, LGBTQ strategy, but particularly around uh, the T uh, element of that. I mean, is that the right way forward is to just kind of focus internally and not speak as much about um, diversity policies? Or is this kind of a temporary moment and you think we'll hear more going forward? Yeah, so I think on some levels, right, for some organizations, the right thing for them to do may be to, again, just not sort of address some of the broader issues. But the companies that are really on the, um, that are really making progress and have made progress over time, those companies are still speaking publicly about the fact that they are going to continue around their diversity and inclusion efforts, that they are going to continue to make progress because they want to reflect the clients and communities that they serve, which is certainly the right thing to do. We've even heard the same conversation coming from some universities as well that um, while affirmative action may have been impacted, they can still make impact in their universities and create inclusive environments where they reflect um, the um, communities and um, in which they're, they're located. So I really think that uh, staying the course for companies can mean a couple of things, whether it means we remain silent, but for others, it means we're gonna continue to speak out and speak out publicly around um, the work that we're doing and leading. Child care, um, what's the most common reason that employers cite for not providing child care for their employees? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Many of the companies that um, I, you know, we have that are part of our coalition that we mainly interact with, all of them have child care. Hmm. So there are very hmm. few that I've come across that um that are uh, that are not providing some level of opportunity for families to care for their children um so i i do think for some though that are not offering it it could be the fact of of affordability for their employee base but there are tons of ways that you can provide child care for your employees without companies having to um pay tons of money for it and provide opportunities flexible work for example um, offering for uh, assistance around um, for for companies to be able to connect people to child care opportunities um, or connect employees to opportunities or places to take their children so that they can come to work and know that their children are in a safe environment. So I think that on some level, there's something that companies can be doing right. that can be yep. very cost effective. All right, Sandra, really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us here on an important topic. Sandra Quince. CEO for Paradigm for Parity, P for P. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. 
I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at P.T. Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.